Lydia is probably a wealthy woman. Scripture doesn't tell us about her husband. I'm going to assume that there is a husband somewhere. So the first question is, how do these people from Thyatira end up in Philippi doing business? We do not know all of the facts. We just know that this lady was a dealer in purple. What else do we know about her? Well, if you could continue in chapter 16 of Acts, I'm at verse 14. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart and she responded to Paul's message. Since Paul was new in this area, and this was his first meeting with individuals, Lydia was probably the first convert. So Lydia, even though she is not mentioned very much, I'm going to say that she has some significance. In the Orthodox Church, she is known as Saint Lydia of Thyatira. In verse 15, it says she and the members of her household. So I'm going to guess that there was a husband and other members. It says she invited us into her home. Here's what she said in verse 15. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, in Jesus, come and stay at my house. It says she persuaded Paul and Silas to come and stay at her house. There's more. As you continue in chapter 16, you know that Paul and Silas are imprisoned because they tried to cast out a demon from a woman who was possessed, so to speak. And when her, she was a fortune teller. Verse 19 of chapter 16 says, When her owners realized that their hope of making money from her was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, verse 20, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept the practice. The crowd joined in the attack, and they were thrown in prison. They were beaten, they were stripped of their clothes, thrown in prison. We know what happened that night. There was an earthquake, and the chains fell off all of the prisoners. But Paul did not leave. Silas did not leave. The people did not leave. Verse 38 says, the officers reported to the magistrates. They heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, and they were alarmed. They came to apologize to them. Verse 40, after Paul and Silas came out of prison, they went back to Lydia's house, where they met with the brethren and encouraged them. A little bit of background as to who Lydia is and why Thyatira is of some significance. There's no other mention of Thyatira in scripture, apart from these two incidents. Thyatira was about 30 or 40 miles southeast of Pergamum. Although it was a smaller city than Pergamum, it was an important center for, of manufacturing, known for pottery, brass making, garment making, and dyeing. In the letter to the church in Thyatira, Jesus declares, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, and your perseverance. Recall that the church at Ephesus was noted for service, but it fell short in the area of love. The church in Pergamum lacked the faith that Jesus saw in Thyatira. The churches at Smyrna and Thyatira shared the virtue of persevering in the midst of difficulties. There's a second part of the compliment that Jesus paid to the church at Thyatira. They were now doing more than they did at first. Unlike the church at Ephesus, which had lost its first love, the Thyatiran church was growing spiritually. But not all was well in Thyatira. And corruption and compromise were starting to set in. Jesus' instruction to those who were being faithful was to hold on. The song that I came up with is not in the new songbook. It's song number 806 in the old songbook, in the third verse. If full salvation you would gain, keep holding on, keep holding on. To conquer sins that bring you pain, keep holding on, keep holding on. God loves to give the better part, not unto those who only start, but those who seek with all their heart, and then in faith, keep holding on. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the enduring faith that you've given to us. Help us, dear God, to hold on. To hold on regardless of circumstances and situations. Please give us all we need. Help us to use all the resources that are available to us so that we will not fall by the wayside, but we will indeed hold on to the end. As we study your word today, we pray that your Holy Spirit will convince us 
of the desire to hold on and convict us so that we will hold on. May we leave this place convinced that you've been with us, that you've helped us and you will help us as we strive to hold on. Question number one, I was trying to get us to recall what we know about Thyatira. So I sort of have given you some background there. Question number two is where we're going to spend much of our time. Look at verse 19 of what we just read. And the question is in two parts. Part A says, for what four attributes did Jesus command the church in Thyatira? I'm going to write the list down. What relationship, if any, can you see amongst these attributes? And how do they differ? So what are the similarities or the relations and what are the dissimilarities or differences? I see it as being progressive. Yeah. Okay. You know, they, they started out with, uh, with love, uh, which uh, t- turns into even deeper faith, and then, which, uh, then of course we want to take that faith and do something with it, so there's our service, and, and, and they persevered in doing it. They didn't do it just for a little while. Any other comments? Please. It's a mixture of, of uh, fruit of the Spirit and gift of the Spirit. Oh, man. <laughs> I was either going to say that or what I said. <laughs> it's also a circular thing because you keep doing one and it increases each one and it gets more and it becomes greater and greater and greater. Okay. Differences. Can you serve Without love? Yes. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. This is part of the problem that the Ephesian church had. They started out being strong in love, and they continued being strong in service. And uh, the condemnation was you lost the zeal and the love you used to have. You're still doing what you were doing, but the motive has changed. Let's get to some application. In your own experience, what causes the love to wane even as we continue to be excellent in service? Because the people you're serving can be stupid. <laughs> 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 Moses knew that pretty good. <laughs> and also because the more you serve, sometimes the tireder you get. Yeah. The more you're doing things, the tired you, you get and you forget to focus on the love because you're so busy doing the work. It's kind of the vicious side of the cycle. There's a busyness that gets into the service. There's a tiring because of so much service. How does that affect the love? You run out of time and energy to continue Bible study and prayer when you're very, very active. And it, it begins to take a back seat. And then, then it becomes evident that uh, your love is diminishing. The problem of burnout. Mm-hmm. I thought of two ladies, two sisters, Mary and Martha. Mm-hmm. And a different post sign they had. One was focused on being at Jesus' feet to absorb everything he had to say. And the other was concerned with being busy, making the service look good. Things are in their proper place. And Jesus said to her, to Martha, when she complained, my sister isn't helping me. He said, Mary chose the better part. This love and devotion. You were going to say. He's still expected to eat. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes in in the act of service, at some points, you're not, you may be not getting through to people, and it, you kind of, it's like, Diminish your love or your faith. You know, it, because you're you're working and working, you see you're not making progress. You're trying, but it's not. You're just not getting the result that you want, mm-hmm. and that sometimes can diminish your your love. I was going to say, love has to be cultivated, and that's not only the love that you might have for another human being, um, even a stranger. You don't instantly love someone. At least I don't. So you have to get to know. You have to see them the way the Lord sees them. And these kinds of things have to be cultivated. Even our love for the Lord, it grows the more we know of Him. And that has to be cultivated. 
And so I think that if one gets so caught in the acts that one is doing and doesn't cultivate either initially or continually the love, that can then render that service a loveless service. It still looks like service on the outside, but it is devoid of the necessary love. At the, at the beginning we talked about this being some kind of reinforcing circle, but it seems as though the love cannot be there in great measure initially. We start with more of a me focus, like a baby. And then we learn the love. It's good to get to love, get to that point where you say, yes, I love. And not only that, we get to love, but we deepen that love, even for faith. Sometimes you can come to faith very quickly, but the love does take a lot of effort. I would add on to what Cynthia just said. As a farmer, I know what it means to cultivate, mm -hmm. and you have to. Mm -hmm. uh, we planted flowers all around our new house we have. And if I don't go out there and cultivate, Gene waters, but I cultivate. I get in there and jerk, work that dirt up. Mm -hmm. And that's cultivating. Mm -hmm. And that's giving them things from the soil mm -hmm. that they wouldn't get otherwise. And in the life of the church, you can have all kind of service projects, but if the people doing them don't feel that you love them, and you don't yeah. celebrate your fellowship and have parties and stuff, you know, to energize each other, um, it's it's a hollow sort of action. Bingo, that's a, a issue for us. I Bingo. <laughs> I think we have to learn to persevere in our faith, in our study of the Lord, in our studying His preachings and the text and the love of the Lord Himself. And if we become too wrapped up, in our service, and I've seen people, we've seen people in our own core who are devoted to service within the community. They'll cook a Sunday breakfast for the community every Sunday, and then clean up the kitchen, and then, oh, I'm exhausted, and go home. Never go to the, uh, to the service. And we have to persevere in our study of the Lord. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? You can do a lot of stuff, but if there's no love behind it, then it's sounding brass and clanging cymbal. So we have to make sure that the motive is love. 1 Corinthians 15 says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So balance it. Question number three. What resources enable us to, either individually or as a church, be strong in love, love for God and love for one another, and then strong in faith? Well, scripture, you look at scripture every day, and uh, television, you know, you can watch it on your phone, and television's nice. Really? You know, for scripture, you know, Christian television. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't replace your own time with the Lord and His Word. Because, you know, you've got a special word for you, what you need to do in that situation. Pray the, the pilots go down. And um, Christian fellowships, the fellowship with other people who know the Lord and can uh, set you straight. If, you know, if that's what is being called for. Rebuking and encouraging and all of that. So fellowship, Bible study. Instead of writing television, I put other spiritual resources. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what? The fellowship we get with each other um, is very important. And I got a good listen on that in 2014 when I was not able to get to church for five months. And we had a, the second nursing home I was in, they had a Bible study on Sunday afternoon. I longed for that time because I had other fellow Christians I could speak with and be able to find them. And then uh, 
being separated from the congregation that I was used to being with was difficult. When I went back, it was just, you know, it was like, wow, is this great or what? <laughs> you know, you need that fellowship in order to grow. Other things that you do, I just put everything under to strengthen our love. You can be under to strengthen our faith, too. But I want to know what else is going through your mind. I know that, and I've said this for the past three weeks, when you have a victory, or somebody else has a victory, that helps us to feel strengthened and encouraged in our faith. Like the song said, each victory helps us to win another victory. So you want a fellowship so that you hear other people's experiences, too. Testimonial, so to speak. Revival, so to speak. We talked about it. I saw hand, yes. Go out in nature, get a little dose of what the Lord has made. Before it got all messed up. <laughs> Appreciation of our Father's world. Maybe I don't need two separate lists, yes. I was going to say, you'd be surprised how some repenting um, and confessing your sin before the Lord can be so effective in strengthening your love and your um, faith. So, what's the word I'm searching for? Communion with God. More and deeper communion. We hadn't mentioned that, so it's important to write that here. Any other? What do you do to strengthen your own love or faith? That may have not listed yet. Yes. I, what I personally do, or we do together, is to go out of our comfort zone. Extend ourselves beyond what we are comfortable doing and reaching out to people even when we know that it's going to be upsetting to us or um, there's, there's not a whole lot we can do but to allow the Lord to use us to help other people even when we may not want to. What would be a good summary for what you would say? The, the navigators teach uh, to have to maintain and, and strengthen your new life in Christ four things. Okay. And you got them up there. Prayer, Bible study, fellowship, and one I don't see, but you were talking about it. Witnessing. Yes. Yeah. Sharing. Sharing what you have. You don't share it, you're blocking it up. Thank you. Talk to each other. Bring that one up. That's navigator teaching. Okay. Thanks for that again. There's a uh, expression in the ancient language, in the Hebrew language, called takun olam, and it means heal the world. To reach out and do all you can to heal the world, to bring them to the Lord Jesus, and to help them find God and. In the, in the process, you make your own sacrifices while you are doing this, and you you follow the various phases that you've studied here. So, to kun olam, if you will. Right. And another thing that that I do is that you know, every day we pray for God's protection, His provision, His guidance, and I also pray for His presence in, in my life every day, and that's I know that he is with me every day, but I acknowledge his presence in my life every day. There are things that happen all day long, day in and day out. It's like a huge mosaic when you see how God works his plan, and you're part of that plan. Sometimes you think that the plan is designed for you. Sometimes you realize that it's actually for somebody else, and you're part of it. And so acknowledging God's um, uh, act, action in my life every day. It's not just let it, let it slide by, but give him thanks for even the little things that he does in my life every day. Thankfulness. An attitude of gratitude can help to change a lot. Can you reinforce, you know, sometimes we can get into negativity. 
when somebody cuts you off or somebody says the wrong thing to you because you try to speak to them. How do you get in and stay in that attitude of gratitude? Thanking God for the opportunities, even when the other person doesn't respond the way you want to respond. Because that's how the world is. You know? People will be negative even when they're positive. Be positive. Stay positive, regardless of the circumstances and the situations. That's what the enduring, the persevering is all about. So you keep witnessing, even when the person doesn't want to hear. You may have to change method or tactic where you need to be firm, well rooted. Okay, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm going to keep preaching by the way I live my life. God's faithfulness. One more question, number five. Verse 19. What might Jesus have meant when he told the church of Thyatira they were now doing more than they did at first? Any notes or commentary? They're now doing more. The way I read it was the works. That's the way I'm reading it. Because that was the... Context? The context. Doing, so how about doing more loving and doing more service and doing more persevering? All of the above? And yes? They were, they were growing in Christ. Okay. Um, in one sense, they were learning. You, you don't do more unless you learn what and how to do it. You can do more service without learning, though. Deja vu all over again? Yeah. And, and um, you can do so much service that you're, you're no heavenly good. I, I had a soldier in one corps that was so spiritually minded she was no earthly good. But they can have the reserve, reverse of that. That you can be so service minded you're no heavenly good. If we do what we do because we're known for service as the Salvation Army, and we're not known for the spiritual message of the Salvation Army. And we're in this country. Are we in lost? this country. That's not necessarily the problem. Well, but we need to remember that salvation is our middle name. Love that. Question number six. What was happening that caused the church to be at risk for immorality and idolatry? <coughs> You'll see that coming up. So look at verse 20. Through 21. What's going on? They tolerated Jezebel. And not only her, but her, her following her teaching. The I know it's just too. tolerating her, but following her. Yeah. Which took them away from the Lord. They allowed bad things to happen in the church and didn't correct it. So we don't know... If there's an actual Jezebel, some Bible commentators say this refers back to Jezebel from the kings in uh, Israel and how she brought in the Baals and caused the Israelites to start worshipping the Baals. Whether it is an actual woman or whether they're just tolerating, as Major Jean says, individuals to come in and teach error or to do things that are inappropriate. And the church sits there and nobody says anything. Live and let live. Live and let live. If, if you start to say, well, you know, I don't want to push people out of the church. I'm not going to say anything. We know that the behavior and the practices are not for the spiritual health of the church. But we only talk outside of the church or behind the scenes and no one stands up and says this is wrong. So that could be allowing Jezebel to come in. And there's just practices that we know should not be that's a, that's approved. That's a very sensitive thing. Mm -hmm. Dealing with wrong. Yes. I know that one. Yes. And we are worried now because the way the church is the way the church is going, there's a lot of is it toleration or tolerance? One of the background things that haven't come up as yet is that in Thyatira they had very strong, I would say trade unions, but it's more trade guilds. So the origin of the trade union is a guild. So the plumbers group gets together and the carpenters group get together. The dye, dye people and the garment makers, they have their strong guilds. The problem was that in doing business, you were associated with people who were not Christian and you were all getting together and doing the same thing. 
And the Christians were told that we should not partake or participate in some of these activities. But in order to continue to be a member of the guild, she found herself associating with people who were practicing and doing things that were idolatrous. And the question is, how do you separate yourselves from that? So part of the call was to tell these individuals, if you claim to be a Christian, you can't participate in groups that are practicing these things. Which is a tricky business, <laughs> to use the word business, because many of us, when we are in business, we join groups of other business people. And we join groups that might do community service. And we go to functions where they're doing things. And you have to remember to stand up and say, well, I personally don't do that, even though the group is doing this. This is part of the problem. This is tolerating Jezebel. You belong to a group. And you feel as though because the group is doing something, I don't want to be a sore thumb, so I'll associate with them because I get benefits from it too, from being in the group. But the group is not wholly committed to God. Yes. I think it's nice also that we see the grace of God in action in verse 21. It says, And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. Sadly, she did not repent. But the Lord is saying, I've given her that time to repent. And so that's the grace right there being spoken of, that we're all being given for whatever we're doing that is displeasing in his sight. We're almost out of time, but I wanted to ask question number eight. Have you ever experienced a church repenting? Have you ever been in a church where the church was called to repentance and people said, we are going to pray? Remember, the Jews were often called to repent. Or even Nineveh was called to repent. Or Israel was called to repent. And when they called from the top, it was repent. People went down and sat on ashes on their knees and said, Lord, we have sinned against you. Have you ever experienced a church in repentance? In one of my appointments, uh, Joyce and I went on vacation. And the YPSM gave a message on repentance. Mm -hmm. And everybody came to the altar. I wasn't even there. And they called and told us about it. And there was a movement that started in that congregation where there wasn't, for six months, there wasn't ever a meeting where people didn't come become seekers. Wow. And it was a movement of the Spirit. And I had to be away. God had to take me out of that before anything happened. In the interest of time, I'm going to go to the application question. What will you do this week to help our church demonstrate more love, more faith, more service, more perseverance? Think on your role and your commitment to helping this congregation develop more love, more faith, more service, and more perseverance. Let's pray. You've called us to be fruitful, dear God, but more than anything, you've called us to persevere, to hold on to the end. And even as we think of the world and the possible contamination with the world, we just pray that you will open our hearts so that we will continue to do what you've called us to do, despite what the world is doing. Keep us focused on you, dear God. Keep us in the center of your will. Help us not to be distracted by the world and its allurements, and that not to be drawn away from anything that is focused on you. So give us the grace and give us the desire to seek first the kingdom, knowing that you've said that all the other things should be added to us. Help us, dear God, in our persevering. And may we be grateful at all times for all you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.